everyone with an interest in NASH, or more broadly, fatty liver disease, surfs up. Season 3, episode 14 of Surfing the NASH Tsunami, our discussion on balloon hepatocytes, starts now. This week on Surfing the Nash Tsunami. We are in effect asking more from the histology than it was ever designed to do. These semi-quantitative scores were not built to be a guide for therapy or something on those lines. They were built to help communication between pathologists. And we're now asking them to be quantitative, to allow us to tightly categorize and ascertain whether there's been a treatment response. What we can take away from this paper and the others, such as the Davison study, is that we're probably asking too much of the existing techniques. And so we need to find a way to support ourselves with them. Ballooning pathophysiologically is extremely important in one of the pathogenic features of the disease. I do remember we tried to question ballooning and, and some people across the aisle started yelling, saying, no, 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 ballooning is the most important thing. And we're not underestimating that. But detecting it has been an issue. Well, I think in 12 to 24 months, we're still going to use histology. But we will see different endpoints. We would still use histology having patients going into trials, potentially then AI supported with a, let's say, from mill area of ballooning on the biopsy or something like that to quantify it and then look at something different at the end of it. It takes an awful lot of energy and concentration to actually focus on the points. So when we're looking at histopathology samples or anything of that intricate detail, the longer we take, the more we look at, the less accurate we're going to be, even if we're looking at the same. This is a big step forward for the field and it can be perceived as a negative or it can be perceived as a positive. The negative is histopathologists have trouble agreeing on what balloon hepatocytes are and that's problematic when they're dispersed throughout the liver with no rhyme or reason. But you can look at it also from a positive viewpoint now. Once that beachhead is established it allows us to plan our next stage of attack and how we're going to move this forward. Ballooning is a spectrum it's part of the hepatocyte family so you're really trying to identify bad apples from all the apples. You know, we're not trying to identify oranges from apples. If you think about semi-quantitative as a word in 24-point type, the reality of where the error has lied historically is that semi has probably been in about 90-point type, and quantitative has probably been in about 8-point type, although we treat quantitative as the only thing that matters. I'd like to see if we can change the type sizes for use of uh, AI-aided histopathology in and of itself. That should shrink semi and increase quantitative quantitative. Every week, a global community of fatty liver disease stakeholders comes together to explore the most important challenges in diagnosing, treating, and developing medications for patients with fatty liver diseases. Join hepatology researcher and key opinion leader, Dr. Stephen Harrison, liver wellness advocate Louise Campbell, pricing and forecasting guru Roger Green, and this week's guests, hepatology researchers and key opinion leaders, Professors Quentin Anstey, Yarn Schottenberg, and Dr. Mazen Nuruddin, and Histoindex Chief Scientist Officer Dean Tai, as they discuss the pivotal issue of complex ballooned hepatocytes this week on Surfing the Nash Tsunami. This episode of Surfing the Nash Tsunami, including the accompanying discussion on identifying ballooned hepatocytes, is sponsored by Histoindex, the world's leading specialist in stain free. AI Digital Pathology Solutions for NASH Clinical Trials. Histoindex is transforming diagnostic standards and drug development for NASH with its AI-based digital pathology. Для всіх, хто цікавиться мережею NASH або загалом жировою хворобою печінки, ловіть хвилю. Для всіх, хто цікавиться мережею NASH або загалом жировою хворобою печінки ловіть хвилю. So for those of us who are not fluent in Ukrainian, that was our friend Anna Tokar, a public health specialist at WHO. I met through her former professor, Jeff Lazarus, repeating the opening line of our podcast in Ukrainian. As a statement of support for the people of Ukraine, we will open every episode in English and Ukrainian until this horrible situation is resolved. Also, I will read a brief statement of support for the Ukrainian people at the end of each episode. Beyond that, this is a unique recording session for several reasons. Number one, as most of you know, we usually record Monday afternoon East Coast U.S. time. 
time. It is now 8 a.m. in the U.S. on Wednesday morning. The reason we're doing that is that when you see the six smiling faces in front of you or five smiling faces in Mazen trying to wake up with good reason, you should know that we are in six different time zones, ranging from Quentin, who's in Singapore, where it's now a bit after nine o'clock in the evening, over to Mazen, who's in Los Angeles, where it's now a bit after five o'clock in the morning, with different time zones as I said, dispersed all the way through. Second, a note to our audience. This episode will have two different sections. The first will run for the next 45 to 50 minutes and discuss the general issue of balloon hepatocytes in the context of the recent Blunt et al. paper on complex balloon hepatocytes that published in the Journal of Hepatology in January. The last author on that paper, Quentin Anstey, will be with us today for the entire episode, both sections. One of the two names right before Quentin is Stephen Harris, and Stephen will be with us for the first section today. The second section, which will follow immediately after that and run roughly half an hour, will discuss the elements of that paper involving how do you build an algorithm to improve balloon hepatocyte identification in patients with advanced fibrosis, along with Mazen Nouradin commenting on his poster from last November's AASLD, poster of distinction, I might note, that discussed ways to improve balloon hepatocyte identification and definition for patients with cirrhosis. Dean Tai from Histo Index, the penultimate author on the Brunt paper, will be with us for that section, and Mazen and Yorn will be with us throughout the episode, and Louise for the first part. So I want to thank Quentin for staying up late, uh, Mazen and Stephen for getting up early, and Yorn and Louise for being able to carve a one-hour hole in the middle of your regular daily schedules, Louise while running a vaccination center, Yorn while doing the many things Yorn does to, to make this episode happen. So thanks to all of you for that. With all that said, let me simply say good morning to everybody in terms of how late it is where you are. So Quentin, how's Singapore this evening? Very nice. It's, uh, I think, a, a balmy 32 degrees centigrade here, but with a little bit of thunder and rain, but very nice indeed. So let it be noted it's 32 degrees here as well, but that's Fahrenheit. A, a very, very different situation. Okay. Next. Yeah, Jorn, how are you today? Hi, Roger. Thanks. It's middle of the day. I managed to squeeze in here. So thanks for reaching out. And I'm very happy and excited to be on this. I think it's a fascinating topic. And then Louise, good afternoon. Good afternoon, everybody. And Quentin, you did a beautiful job of the weather forecast. Well-trained um, UK resident. <laughs> so Louise, go ahead. What's the temperature there right now? Oh, it's about 10 degrees. It's drizzly and it's a day after a major tube strike. So Apart from that, perfect. <laughs> so for those of us in the States who don't do those translations automatically, that's about 50, which is a lot better than it is here in Pennsylvania. Stephen, good morning. Hey, good morning, guys. Great to be here today. Now that we're on weather forecast, it's actually a perfect day in San Antonio, Texas, about 72 degrees Fahrenheit. I guess that's what, I'm not sure how to convert that. At, but about 22, 23. I would convert that to an excellent day. And Mawson, I don't know whether to say good morning or good night because it's kind of somewhere in the middle for you. How are you today? <laughs> yeah. I'm the first one to wake up in LA this morning. Thank you for inviting me this early. Thus, the weather is 53, but you don't look at that because I'm three hours earlier. So we're going to be in 78 this morning. What you, what you don't realize is he's going to leave this podcast and go straight to the LA morning show to do the weather and traffic. <laughs> I'm going to the pool by the end of this because it's going to be 78 then. No, actually, what I was going to say you don't realize, Stephen, is he's not the first guy up in LA because the freeways are already jammed at five in the morning. That's true, probably. With that, now that we've got everybody's weather report and we said hi, simple, quick ground breaker, one good thing, personal or professional, that's happened in each of your lives in the last couple of days. So our audience knows what we've all been up to. Brave one, go first. The great thing that's happened to me is I've discovered a, another part of the world where they use the right sort of electric plugs and also the steering wheel is on the correct side of the car for me when I want to get in. So that's that's always good news. I assume that also means they drive on the correct side of the road for you as well. Absolutely. Yeah, because <laughs> I'll keep that in mind next time I'm in Singapore. Thank you. You. I'll go next. I was just going to compliment Quentin on actually driving in Singapore. It's a lovely city, but I'm not too sure I've drived yet. But, um, I'm not the driver. I'm just the passenger. But it's avoided all that awkwardness of getting in the wrong side of the car. I knew there was a reason. The good thing that's happened to me since the last podcast is just how busy work is at the moment, which is a good thing. And it's like keeping up with it. But that's good for me. But I'm getting to where I am today on the only tube line that was working this morning was a godsend. <laughs> Yeah. Hey, this is Stephen. I'll just chime in. So I was supposed to be experiencing the same electrical plugs as Quentin there in Singapore. And unfortunately, what I learned this week is that uh, in the state of Texas, you can't just take your vaccination card and have that allow you to get into Singapore. So there's got to be some more verification of that data through the QR code process. And the state of Texas does not do that. So as a result, for any Texans listening out there, you don't travel west if uh, you don't have a QR code. 
can go east, but that's about it. There's clearly less traveling for me. I stepped out of clinic recently. We had a team meeting, and I guess the good news for me is that I have my study nurses uh, lined up to offer treatment to patients with advanced liver disease because on the bad side, I saw somebody in his uh, mid-20s today with a KPA of 16 kilopascal and unsuspected of uh, liver disease previously. So uh, it's, it's a good time again that we talk about this disease and what to offer patients in particular if they fell severely sick uh, at an early age. Okay, Martin, you're up. It's a week I'm preparing for, for travel for a meeting to Arizona that Stephen and I are going uh, Liver Connect and Liver Nash. So I just went and I got my QR code that is required for the meeting. After that, actually, I go to San Diego to Scripps. So it's a week full of travel, but I had to get my QR code for the meeting that is that is required. Actually, Martin, I think you and I are supposed to be spending time together in Arizona during that meeting. I look forward to it. It's going to be 85. So bring your shorts and your golf club and we'll hang out there. Yeah. So with all that, why don't we dive in? This is a conversation that really started at Nashtag about a paper that was released before Nashtag. This is about the subject of identifying balloon hepatocytes. Quentin, who is a significant author on paper, last author, if I recall correctly, first brought to our attention exactly how striking the findings of this paper are. Since then, Stephen has been known to characterize it as the lonely balloon hepatocyte kind of almost swimming alone in the sea of cells. But obviously, that paper and its findings have dramatic implications for how we think about histopathology, the vital need for AI, and the whole general scoring system. So without much more ado, Quentin, do us all a favor. Take maybe five, seven minutes and run everybody through the paper and exactly what it does and says it is. Yeah, sure. Thanks, Roger. It's fitting that you mentioned NASHTAG there, because this piece of research actually grew out of a conversation that started in NASHTAG between myself, Beth Brunt, and Dean Tai for history index. The, the backstory to this is that I was giving a presentation. I made uh, a foolish comment about the use of Victorian technology to identify and characterize liver biopsies. And Beth and I carried this conversation on at the coffee queue and then decided, right, well, what we need to do is find a way of really understanding what was being seen down the microscope. The big challenge here is that there have been now a number of studies which have been published over the years demonstrating kappa values for, for example, quantifying ballooning in the order of about 0 0.56, 0 0.57, coming out from the NASH CRN. So really excellent pathologists, but even over a 15-year gap, not being able to improve those kappa values. And then, of course, you saw the, the data coming out from the Davison paper. Again, the challenges of inter and intra observer variation. With those papers, the big question is, well, is it how people apply a semi-quantitative scoring system? Is that where the challenge is? Or is it more fundamental than that? Is it actually the case that people are seeing different things down the microscope? And is that what's contributing to the variation that has been described when these semi-quantitative scores are applied? So, we set out uh, for this paper with a, with a number of goals. The first one was to really understand what the pathologists, when they were looking at NASH biopsies, were terming a balloon cell, and to understand whether they were looking at the same cells or different cells. Beyond that, we then wanted to see, well, how well does that correlate to that determination of NASH, no NASH? Because, of course, many of us consider a balloon cell to be really the, the touchstone, the shibboleth that identifies steatohepatitis. So we wanted to see, well, that's our belief, but is that actually how it's being used in practice? And then the third part of the paper was to begin to understand whether we could use an artificial intelligence-based machine learning computerized approach tied, in this case, to a second harmonic generation microscopy, so SHG microscopy, to actually stabilize that in the ultimate goal for it to be an assistive technology to help pathologists identify balloon cells. But in the first instance, whether we could use the learning we developed with human pathologists to better train those artificial intelligence algorithms. Those were the three goals. Maybe now what I'll do is just quickly walk you through what we did and what we found. So we took nine of the world's leading pathologists who have been incredibly generous with their amount of time they've given, and we asked them to score 10 liver biopsies, looking at these digitized slides and literally drawing round each cell on those slides that they determined to be a balloon cell. And they did that independently. We then waited three months, represented those same images to them, but in a different order, and some of them mirrored or rotated through 90 degrees, and asked them to repeat that same exercise of identifying 
the balloon cells once more. We then look to see, well, were all the pathologists identifying the same balloon cells? And this was one of the really striking features from this study, that actually the degree of concordance between pathologists at the cell level was relatively modest, uh, I think would be a fair statement. And this implies that, of course, what they're seeing, what they're determining as a balloon cell, is hugely different between individual pathologists. What we also found was over these 10 sections that they looked at, there was not a single section where every pathologist either considered there was ballooning present or absent concordantly, with the exception of one slide. So in other words, given that we take the presence of ballooning to be a key feature for the presence of steatohepatitis, hepatitis and the complete absence of ballooning to be necessary to determine there has been NASH resolution in clinical trials, what we were finding here was that if you took those same slides and gave them to a different pathologist from the trial pathologist, you wouldn't necessarily get that same answer about NASH resolution. So that was an important message in terms of how our thinking should be going forward about trial endpoints and so on. And then we moved on from the data. We developed this concordance atlas of cells where there was commonality, looking at, for example, where three, five, seven pathologists all had selected the same cells. And we were able to use these to train an artificial intelligence uh, histological interpretation, what we call Q-ballooning 2, to better identify balloon cells and with a performance level at least as good as the human pathologists and comparable to those. So, some really interesting features there, Roger. Data about how we perceive balloon cells, information about the variation between observers, which has significant implications, I think, for our thinking about clinical trials. And then finally, how can we fix this? What are the options for the future? And that move to potentially develop better assistive technologies that can that can help us tackle that. Quentin, first of all, thanks for a really uh, elegant summary of a major and complex piece of work. Every time I read or think about this paper, I get a different vision, but the vision I got in this moment was a friend of mine a long time ago whose mother came to the States and she spoke no English. She spoke Polish and Hebrew and a couple of other languages. She would watch American soap operas, and then in Hebrew, she would tell my ex-wife what it was that she had just watched. And she was completely sure she knew the plot, and the plot she talked about had nothing to do with what was going on on the TV screen, because they just weren't looking at the same thing. Uh, this almost feels like that, right? Yeah, absolutely. That's a very good description of this. It, it appears that there isn't a common vocabulary. And although there are some terms and some characteristics that pathologists use that helps them have a broad idea about it. It's only with the advent of digital pathology that they've truly been able to look at exactly the same cells and determine which of them they consider to be truly ballooned. So it, it's an important differentiation. Okay, great. So we'll be talking about that in detail, that particular sentence in detail in the second half of this conversation. But for now, let me just throw the floor open to questions or comments from our panelists, all of whom are far more learned than I am. Go ahead, jump in, anybody. Yeah, I'll, I'll uh, jump in. First of all, Quentin, you're a pioneer in this field and a leader, and this is another example of, of taking on a major problem and trying to provide answers and, and how to move forward. So one thing I always learned from you is a new word, a new term, a new phrase. Today, it was shibboleth. Maybe I'm naive. I did not know that word, but apparently that's tagline, catchword, cry, a banner, a slogan, a watchword. And that is very descriptive of a balloon hepatocyte and the way we perceive that in, in our Nash vernacular. And just taking a look back and thinking about Nash tag and where this was presented originally, and where the idea came from to do this, you partnering with the pathologist to drive this initiative forward was, in a lot of ways, transformative. And that one slide that we show of the single balloon hepatocyte, the lone hepatocyte that all nine pathologists agreed upon, you want to replicate that over and over again. And you want to say, what is unique about that cell? What can all nine pathologists take away from that cell that can go teach all the other pathologists and say, this is, this is what we're looking at? And I think 
the SAF kind of gets at that a little bit. It's a bigger cell. You know, it's not a few versus many. It's the size of the cell. I think we're beginning to unravel that, to unpack that a little bit more. But I think this idea of perception, of variation of pathologist viewpoints is critical because it adds to what we already know about the heterogeneity of balloon hepatocytes. So, and I think we mentioned this on the podcast before, we talk about one fifty thousandth of the liver in a core sample. But what we don't talk about is that usually a core generates 13 to 15 slices. And we only look at one H&E typically of that core. So really we're taking, let's say, one fourteenth of one fifty thousandth. So we're looking at one seven hundred thousandth of the liver. And when you look at that heterogeneity on top of a perception and a variation in the style at which they're read, it, it almost becomes like finding a unicorn in a, a unicorn needle in a haystack. I mean, it's really problematic. And I think this AI digital pathology is incredible in, in helping us learn about the variation. But let me ask you this, taking this forward into how we can use this technology to improve drug development, do you see a situation where we can look at the volume change in balloon hepatocytes and link that to a change in fibrosis per se. So Q ballooning, Q fibrosis, kind of collinearity, if you will, just like we've done with Q-steatosis and Q-fibrosis, is there a way we can now take this technology into drug development and look at pre and post liver biopsies and maybe say, you don't have to get rid of all ballooning. We just have to show a reduction in a percentage or something like that. So I think that's a really important point you've made there, Stephen. What comes out of this is that identifying a balloon cell is much more complex than certainly we as non-histopathologists have ever appreciated before. This is about subtle changes. And because they are subtle, they're open to differences of interpretation. And so what challenge we're faced with is that there isn't a right answer. We don't actually have a true ground truth. What we did here was by looking at concordance of true expert pathologists, we were able to identify a meaningful number where the majority would agree it was a balloon cell and so on. And I think that opens the way because what we can now do is begin to train these algorithms as we've demonstrated with Q-ballooning 2. And use that, I would hope. And there's a caveat here, which is that the regulators clearly need to agree to this. But we need to use these techniques to allow us to standardise our assessment of ballooning and use that then to be more quantitative. It doesn't necessarily matter if Q-ballooning 2 is perfect any more than it doesn't really matter if a given trial pathologist is perfect. What we require, though, is something that is quantitative and consistent. And once it is able to do that, we can then detect change. And to the second thing you said there, Stephen, which I think is absolutely true, this idea of absolute loss of ballooning is a fiction, and we need to move away from that concept. It should be about reducing it, improving this, because clearly you can give the same image to a number of expert pathologists and potentially Eventually, they will all see or not see a balloon cell in it. And that's not a reflection of their skill, which is tremendous. It's a reflection of how subjective these particular features are. Uh, let me make a statement. First of all, congratulations, Quentin, on this landmark paper. It's kind of if you're shooting, it's hitting the bull's eye in the middle. And this is one of the fundamental problems we have in the field. Let me start setting the stage saying like ballooning pathophysiologically is extremely important in one, one of the pathogenic features of the disease. And uh, I do remember we tried to question ballooning and, and some people across the aisle started yelling saying, no, 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 ballooning is the most important thing. And we are not underestimating that, but detecting it has been an issue. So I'm going to make bold statements and questions for you, Quentin. Um, given this cleaning failure rate and seeing many of my patients going into NASH trial, finding NAS score of 6 and fibrosis F3 but no ballooning cell or let's say NAS of 5 and uh, no ballooning cell and they get kicked out from clinical trial. Based on your study, should this be call for action into reconsidering the whole ballooning in clinical trials? And I want to go as far as making it unethical anymore to really get fixated on the ballooning cell. Again, it's important but we're not detecting it well. Two, 
should, I guess, a study like yours be the base of moving immediately toward using AI technology to take the ballooning cells? Or do you think you need a little bit more validation for this study moving forward? Yeah, that's a really interesting question, Mazen. I mean, I, I think there are a couple of things we have to remember here. When ballooning was being described, when any of these histological features were being described, it was at that point a shorthand to allow a diagnosis to be made and to assess it in a qualitative sense. Because we are now at the phase of drug development and we're looking for endpoints and so on, we are in effect asking more from the histology than it was ever designed to do. So these semi-quantitative scores were not necessarily built to be a guide for therapy or something on those lines. They, they were built to help communication between pathologists and we're now asking them to be quantitative, to allow us to tightly categorise and ascertain whether there's been a treatment response. So what we can take away from this paper and the others, such as the Davison study, is that we're probably asking too much of the existing techniques. And so we need to find a way to support ourselves with them. So I've been very careful about using the word assistive technologies here. I don't think this is about doing away with human histopathologists in trials. But what I think we would like to see, or what I would like to see, is the use of these techniques either to guide where ballooning might be. And that's something we're already seeing in radiology, for example, where they're looking at images and they have AI assistance to help them spot nodules that may be difficult or lesions that may be difficult in scans. So I think there's the concept of an assistive technology technology like that. The second step may well be that you use a human pathologist to confirm this is fatty liver disease. No, this isn't autoimmune hepatitis. But when you actually want to quantify and to therefore be able to detect change, you hand that over to a machine where quantification can be done in a much more standardised approach. So I don't think this is about a sea change in everything and that human pathology is not good. It's about asking the right question and using the right tool in the correct situation. Sure. How about this? If I have a patient entry criteria as NAS, four and higher, with at least one point of inflammation, ballooning, and steatosis, and then they get to the F2 and higher. We know F2 and higher, they go into trial. There are trials that start F3 and higher. And we do know that the prognostic factor is fibrosis. Would you at least say NAS four and higher, any F2 for the F2 studies or F3 and higher, but you don't have to have one point on each one of them, given a paper like yours as entry criteria. So I don't think that that's really what the paper is speaking to, Mazen. The idea isn't about, oh, well, we should therefore ignore what we consider. We consider that the presence of certain features is important for the pathophysiology. What we need to do is to assess those in a more standardized approach, not essentially give ourselves a free pass. And to your point about clinical clinical trials. Uh, I suspect that you already do exactly the thing that is necessary to avoid this, which is when a biopsy comes back from one clinical trial and the central pathologist says, oh, I can see F3, I can see steatosis, I can see inflammation, but I can't see ballooning. You probably say, well, great, thank you very much. I'll send that on off to the next trial and we'll get a different pathologist who will quite possibly see a balloon cell. So you're already doing what our study has demonstrated, which is that you can see certain pathologists are more or less likely to detect ballooning. And we saw that very nicely. There were certain pathologists who, if you like, tended to run hot, tended to see a lot of balloon cells, and other pathologists who tended to run cold and tended not to see balloon cells. Um, so you're probably already doing that subconsciously. Indeed, but that's costing the patient another biopsy. Actually, I can see a couple challenges with that that I'll come back to in a minute. But Euron, please go ahead first. Quentin, thanks for your leadership in leading this effort. Uh, it's great to see also the group of co-authors you pulled together there so right on. I don't think the discussion is about what is NASH because we are well aware of the clinical patient phenotype. And the discussion in, in your paper and, and the points you highlight is that we're probably over-probing liver histology. We're asking more from liver histology than it can give us. Uh, that's my take home. So my two questions for you is, do you see a way to augment histology by using a, a, a liquid biomarker on top of it, combining it with a surrogate compound score? And the second thing is, did you discuss some staining? Because the field always says that if we would have a specific stain for a balloon cell, 
this could be one way also to augment it and and, and move it forward. Yeah, so I'll, I'll take the second one of those first, uh, and uh, I'm going to plead jet lag, and I may ask you to uh, repeat the first one again, John. But in terms of the specific stain, the problem is there isn't. There have been a number of things proposed, like Sonic Hedgehog, for example, which potentially are helpful in detecting balloon cells. But there isn't a ground truth. There isn't one thing that if you stain it with this, the balloon cells all light up guaranteed, because otherwise we'd use it and there would be no need for for everything we're doing here. That's one of the problems. Yes, there are a whole number of different stains that might help, but where do you draw the line with them? And as yet, we don't know if they're responsive to therapy or anything else. So it becomes more difficult. And what was the other bit again? Sorry. So let me rephrase. The second question was, I mean, you discussed the technical challenges that different pathologists do not call a balloon cell a balloon cell all the same time. Are there biomarkers, liquid biomarkers that can help us to enrich and find more balloon cell in a patient? Is there an omics signature of a ballooning in NASH? Yeah. So one of the things, and this is one of the things that I'm, I'm quite excited about. So obviously you and I published jointly and with, with Stephen as well, a number of studies looking at transcriptomics and looking at proteomics and so on in fatty liver disease. And another paper on lipidomics actually has just been accepted for JHEP reports this week, which will be coming out quite shortly. But all of those at the moment are founded on light microscopy and human pathology. And I think one of the things that will potentially help us to identify better biomarkers is to take away the intra-observer and intra-observer variation by using a digital approach and then repeating some of those omics studies, which will be very informative in their own right. So I think there's a piece of work there. In terms of what can we do right now to help us identify balloon cells? Well, I think there we've got a few things. So there are very few biomarkers that are specifically designed to detect steatohepatitis and then do it well, as you know. So we don't have many. People have proposed things like cytokeratin 18. So-so. The one that's potentially a bit more interesting is, of course, NIS4, where it was specifically designed for fibrosing steatohepatitis. Wet biomarkers like that potentially have some leverage here because they at least will allow you to enrich your biopsy population for the presence of steatohepatitis, which is also the presence of ballooning. So that's probably the way it will guide us. But that doesn't necessarily mean that you completely rely on the NIS4, for example, to supplant biopsy. I I don't think the regulators are quite ready for that one yet, although with time, maybe they will be. Thank you for great questions and Quentin for great answers. I want to make one really quick observation. I've heard this phrase semi-quantitative for as long as I've been talking to you folks, and it's always rubbed me wrong, and I've never figured out why until I was listening to you today, Quentin. The problem with semi-quantitative has to do with the definition of statistical error, which is that when we define statistical error in terms of some measure, variation from a measure of central tendency, what we're assuming is that all the data that goes into that measure is equally accurate. Because it's semi-quantitative, by definition, that can't be right. So there's going to be the error that we can track through sample. And then there's going to be the error in observers, which will vary depending upon what you're measuring. But we now have the Davison paper and this work to tell us that the semi part of semi-quantitative and the error associated with semi dwarfs the error associated with quantitative per se. So we're powering studies based on the assumption that error is all statistical. And in fact, error is far more observational than it is statistical. And you can't put error margins around that stuff. You simply have to improve it. And the way to improve it is either forget about it or quantitate it. So when I listen to you and I listen to Moz and I listen to Moz and asking, well, are there situations where we should forget about it? And you saying, really, what we need to do first is figure out if we can better quantitate it. Does, does that make sense? I think you've summarized that brilliantly, Roger. Uh, and, and that is the point. We have techniques, we are developing techniques that will help us to better quantify it. It may be the histo index platform. Others are available, such as Path AI. All of these give you a stabilized read and they can probably all be improved but that already is an important step forward. Okay, so with that, thanks. Let me turn to Stephen before we lose him and, and ask for you to comment on all the different ways in which this plays through in clinical trials today and what you can see as the value of enhancement if we do a better job on this. And by the way, what that better job might look like. Roger, that's a great question. If I had the answer, I would... Uh 
well, we, we would be able to rapidly move forward with drug development. I think it's a, still a bit of a mystery as to how we use this technology to extract all the amazing things it can do and really shed light on, on a process improvement pathway. You know, to me, the area that, that I think we need to improve in drug development in NASH is, is on the back end of these trials. When we're looking at paired histopathology and we're trying to say, did this drug meet its primary endpoint? Is the therapeutic index worth taking this drug forward? You know, we can do safety and tolerability very well in this field. The issue is the efficacy piece. And whether you look at elafibrinor for fibrosis or you look at lanafibrinor versus semaglutide for fibrosis, or you look at MSDC-0602K, which was the reason that the Davison paper exist today, what you find is the placebo response rates are widely varied. And, it, and just take a step back and think about that. Elafibrinor, had the placebo response rate been the same as a choic acid, would still be in development right now. And lanafibrinor and semaglutide had almost identical fibrosis response rates. Sima gets the hook for fibrosis because the placebo response rate was 33% relative to Lani's response rate, which was much less. So I think when we begin to think about how we can immediately try to apply this technology, to me, it gets back to what I said at the beginning. Is there some ability to use this technology quantitatively to show that improvement in a percentage of balloon hepatocytes actually correlates to a change in fibrosis, which we know links to an outcome? And that gets us away from having to show histopathologically that there is no balloon hepatocyte. The other thing I think would be helpful, and I, I guess I'm going to advocate for this again, is just looking at more tissue. We take the tissue, let's look at it. Let's don't leave it in a paraffin block. Let's actually use it to help get over the heterogeneity of ballooning. So we can use both, I think. And the more that we use this collectively, I always go back to an elephant in a dark room. If we're feeling a leg or a tail or a snout, we may not know that it's an elephant. But I think applying these different techniques allow us to step away and see the bigger picture for what it really is. So, you know, for the pre-screening techniques, I think that were mentioned earlier, uh, we're working on that. I mean, we've used AST plus FibroScan KPA for a little over four years now to drive the right patients toward histopathology. What I can tell you is that actually worked until we pivoted away to more than one pathologist looking at the tissue. And when we went to that, because of good reason, now there was not agreement between the two pathologists. So now we've stepped beyond that to consensus reading. So now we have two or three pathologists that look at the slides independently. Where they disagree, they come together and review, or they have a third one that comes in and reviews. And so so that gets us back to refining our pre-screen strategy. And NIS-4 actually, as Quentin mentioned, was developed with that intent in a way where it takes four different biomarkers and really tries to identify the inflammatory activity of the liver plus fibrosis. And that's exactly what we're looking for histopathologically. So I do think that we can refine our pre-screen strategy a bit more and, and we can look at more liver tissue when we do the liver biopsy. We can apply AI digital pathology to that to help augment what we're doing. And then we need to look at that at the end of the trial too, to see if we can minimize placebo response rates and we can stabilize the overall efficacy of the drug and actually get it truth. You know, does this drug work or does it not? My fear is that we've left good drugs that are effective, we marginalize them and we push them into the graveyard prematurely. I think Al Deferman is a good example of that as well. Any questions or comments? I'd agree with everything that you guys have said, but I was actually going to look at a slightly different angle when we look at the histopathologists. Our brains work in different ways. And we know that when we do decisions early in the morning and when we're fresh, we make good decisions. There's a similar study, Quentin, you might be aware of it, where they looked at nine Supreme Court judges who looked at paroles and and at the beginning of, and they looked at a thousand decisions by these nine judges. You start off very early in the morning or after lunch with a really high rate of paroles. I think it was 65%. I think it was Lavav and his research. And by the end of the session, you got 0% of people getting parole. Now, we know that our brains work in different ways. We know that it takes an awful lot of energy and concentration to actually focus on the points. So when we're looking at histopathology samples or anything of that, 
that intricate detail. The longer we take, the more we look at, the less accurate we're going to be, even if we're looking at the same things. So not distrusting the data that's in front of us, but actually when it's read, who it's read by, how many times it's read by, different times of the day, what's happened before, have significant influence potentially on what we see in these slides. And that may well be a factor because it's a factor psychologically in anything we do at those sort of levels. But bringing in AI, as you say, to complement that, to see where it agrees or disagrees is in support of histopathologists. Because I'm not aware of any uniformity to reduce the natural reasons that our brain works in different ways and why we tire and we, we lose concentration and decision making. Because those judges were all asked and they felt they made the same decisions on the same metrics for every single prisoner and they didn't. So in a similar way, histopathologists can't make the same decisions later on in the sessions. It's not the way our brain or our capacity works. So Louise, I think that's a really interesting point and it does come back to this, how do you control for what there is intra-observer variation? And again, this is one of the places where standardizing it by using AI approaches can potentially be very, very helpful. Okay, first of all, Stephen, before we bid you adieu, which I'm assuming is going to be within the next minute, five minutes, uh, any other comments or thoughts you want to add so that we make sure to get them into this conversation before if we, and if we lose you? I think I'll just add that this type of work literally to me is like D-Day. We, we, we attacked an issue. We now have a beachhead, but, but we've still got a lot of work to do. <laughs> You know, we have we have the right people. We have the right technology to do it. We just need to take the time. We need to carefully ask the right questions um, and we need to go address those questions with with data. But this is the right step. This is a big step forward for the field. And it can be perceived as a as a negative or it can be perceived as a positive. I mean, yes, the negative is histopathologists have trouble agreeing on what balloon hepatocytes are. And that's problematic when they're dispersed throughout the liver with no rhyme or reason and it's very, very heterogeneous. But you can look at it also from a positive viewpoint. And I think that's exactly what this paper has done. And it allows us now, once that beachhead is established, it allows us to plan our next stage of attack and how we're going to move this forward. So again, kudos to you, Quentin, for uh, doing this, for having that frank discussion with Dr. Brunt. I know that she is passionate about this. She loves what she does. We all love her. She has been instrumental and an icon in this field. We certainly appreciate her passion for everything that she's done in NASH. And that has allowed this to take place along with your efforts and those with Histo Index. So thank you again. And I'll stop there. Thank you, Stephen. And, and just to echo that, I think it's really important to acknowledge the phenomenal team of pathologists and hepatologists who all all came together to realize this piece of work because it was uh, a genuine team effort. And kudos to all of you for that because it's a fantastic piece of work. I have a kind of a naive question. I've tried to work this out on the back of an envelope several times, but I just don't have enough insight to do that. How many balloon hepatocytes would you expect to see on an average slide? Would you expect the average observer to see on the average slide? And then given the low concordance that you're talking about between the nine observers, how many concordant balloon hepatocytes might you expect to see on an honest slide? Zero. And Maz and I got to two plus or minus six. That's the reason I'm asking the question. Fundamentally, that's the problem. I guess I've looked at thousands of histopathology slides with fatty liver disease over my two decade career, you kind of get to the point where I've learned from Beth, Dr. Brunt, who trained me, and we would look at slide after slide. And you get to a point where the architecture just looks like Nash. It just has a, a feel, a flavor to it that it's Nash. And then you go looking specifically for a balloon hepatocyte versus you look at something and it's just bland fat. And even if you see something that looks like a hepatocyte, you're like, eh, I'm not sure that's really a balloon hepatocyte. The architecture looks like like Nash, we force ourselves to look for balloon hepatocytes. And we see that actually in the beta colic acid paper, where when you look at Nash as defined of inflammation of zero or one, no ballooning, you get a very different answer than if you just ask for the gestalt resolution of Nash by a pathologist. They actually are not aligned up at all. So I think it's it's a bit challenging to, to answer that question in a very quantitative manner. Yeah, and just to add to that quickly, you know, my impression is they tend to then lump together. You get these patients where you have these areas of balloon hepatocytes. And I think in your paper, Quentin, 
and you had this picture. One pathologist drew it a little larger because you get the feeling there's another balloon kind of squeezed onto the main balloon cell. And I think there's this clumps of uh, balloon hepatocytes. And then there are these patients where you got to get go hunting. And I think that's, again, is that, are those different patients? They'll probably get a different in the NAS score for, uh, for their scoring here, one versus two. In this context, we do not understand everything that this lump of balloon hepatocytes or the single balloon hepatocyte means for a patient. No, absolutely. And just to pick up on something Stephen said there, it's it's very interesting that the Q-ballooning 2 algorithm does actually contain some features of fibrosis as indicators of the likelihood of ballooning being present. So it's exactly that. The computers are already recognizing what the pathologists are doing, which is you take an overview, you, you assess, you, you get a, a feel for something, and then you need to try to identify the specifics to back up that theory. And it, it's what's already coming out in that coding as well, this idea that we're looking at it. And it, it speaks to the incredible complexity of the information and the visual clues that are being assimilated when you're looking at pathology. I'm just going to have to bug out, guys. But uh, thank you again, Roger, for organizing this. Jorn coming on at, you know, in the middle of your day, Mazen for waking up at the butt crack at dawn. Maybe you're going to go back to sleep. I don't know. And Quentin, sorry I missed you. I was looking forward to hanging out with you for a couple of days and I send my best to the to the team over there. Louise, we'll talk to you again soon as well. Thanks, guys. Thanks, Stephen. Take care. Bye-bye now. So, Quentin, I thought that last comment of yours was um, really to the point. Uh, if you go back to my, my last comment, that what we're trying to do is we're trying to capture uh, visual data in a limited number of measures that focus on very specific phenomena within it. So it's it's not surprising to me that the first thing that happens when you put this in front of a computer is the computer says, okay, this is a holistic assessment. How do we start to assess more holistically before we get down to the specific thing that we're looking for? And that does feel like, a, as Stephen pointed out in his training, that does feel like how the human mind works. We're kind of getting to the end of our time for this session. Well, we have a few minutes left. Uh, so, Mazen, you're in questions, comments, anything you want to share? I'm fascinated, again, with this kind of work. It's very really important for the field. It's pushing it forward, and I congratulate the authors on, on this work. You are in Go ahead. comments, thoughts? Between the group, the main problem of the difficulties to identify the cells has been addressed. I mean, something that Stephen didn't mention this time around, I kind of was waiting for his comment, is the number of slices you should get from a biopsy to then start looking and finding those uh, balloon hepatocytes. Quentin, maybe you want to comment on that, um, it, because that's something normally what comes up. If we can't find it on that one random slide that we just took from that liver biopsy. Maybe we got to look in a different place. So this is an interesting question. And so if you're looking for a balloon cell and you keep taking sections, eventually, all things being equal, you're quite likely to find a balloon cell. The problem is when you're then wanting to judge therapeutic response, the more sections you do, the more likely you are to find a balloon cell. Therefore, you haven't demonstrated a complete absence of a balloon cell. So but beware of what you wish for, I think, is the key thing here. And much better to take what we consider to be and have always considered to be a reasonable sample, whether that's one section or two sections, it doesn't really matter, and assess it in a very stable, very standardized way. Because then you've got the headroom to show increase or reduction later on when you do the end of treatment biopsy. So that's my Take on it. Yeah, so Quentin, if you increase the sample, even if you're looking for something rare, and this is again from a completely naive perspective, you should increase the potential for variability as well. That that doesn't overcome the problems we're talking about. So I get the point that goes if you go hunting for slides until you find one with a balloon hepatocyte, that's not likely to be a solution. But Stephen's answer has been three uh, as the number to, to focus in on. It actually is one of the thoughts behind my question about how many can you find on a on an average slide. Appreciating there is no average slide, but the the idea being that you need a common number and that one is probably suboptimal. As you rightly say, there isn't an average side, there isn't a clear answer. What we've identified is that there was huge variation on any one given slide in terms of the number of balloon cells. So, for example, uh, slide five, which was the one that every pathologist considered to have the most balloon cells, the the number of balloon cells ranged anywhere up to about, I think it was about 225 down to about 45, depending on which pathologist was looking at that one image. So that gives you an idea of the variation you're, you're, you're dealing with here, uh, Roger. 
Yeah, difficult to manage number. Other questions, comments from, from anybody? And then I want to go to a wrap-up question on this session, and then we'll move on to the second half of the conversation. I was only just going to comment on what Stephen was saying earlier. And if we're going to look at samples from patients who donate these samples, we need to be using more tissue, if necessary, to get the best value out of the tissues. And if that helps a pathologist get the right patient into the right trial, or actually exclude them on the best information, then we should be able to use more tissue if it's felt to be necessary, because these are highly valuable samples and they're not the nicest of procedures as we all know so making most use of that tissue for any patient in this, the trials are really really important. Thanks Louise. Let me get the last question which is if we could go up in a helicopter and come down 12 months from now and if that doesn't work try 24 months from now what will realistically be different and what is it appropriate to aspire to being different in how in, in how we do this process and where it's taken. Quentin go first that's great. Dive in. So I think there are Two things I would like to see, whether it's at 12 months or 24 months, I, I, I'm, I'm not so sure. The first is, I think we need to move away from this concept of absolute loss of ballooning as a trial endpoint. And I think we've touched on this already. We need to consider ballooning as a continuous variable, which is quantifiable, so that we can actually assess change in it. And that's one of my biggest hopes. And that requires thought from input from the field, input from drug developers, from regulators, and, and so on to get to that point. But we need to move away from this yes, no question about ballooning. The second thing I would like us to see is I would like to see the field moving further towards an understanding that AI assistive technologies actually should be used to support drug development. Um, I think we are it's, it's an area where there's a huge amount of development going on, um, but we're already seeing how it can be used to help stabilize assessment, reduce variation, and potentially support human pathologists to actually assess biopsies in a more quantitative way in the drug development space. So those are my two hopes. Okay, thanks, Quentin. Uh, anybody else? Go ahead. I have the same answer, and I like the timeline. In 24 months, I think more, more realistic than 12 months. 12 months? Yeah, 12 months. Uh, good morning. It's 5 a.m. In 24 months, I would like to see machine learning technology being used for, at, at minimum, entry criteria for registry trials and, and hopefully understanding how we use them uh, for outcomes. Speaking of that, I know you're, on, you're a big fan of screening failure, teasing out, like, what can we do better? So I do wonder if you want to look at this new technology and using the this paper to, to see how much we can reduce screening failure in clinical trial. You can just take one trial and, and, and see what was the screening failure rate uh, due to ballooning. And then if you use this technology, what would it be? That's interesting. Jorn, that's a great, great lead in to you since I think about screening failure and you frequently in the same sentence. Go ahead. <laughs> screen failure is obviously of concern. And, and you know, for good reasons, we use histology to qualify patients for clinical trials for the use of a drug where we do not have certainty that the benefit for the patient is there. So I think, you know, there's clear room and that's why I think in 12 to 24 months, we're still going to use histology. Maybe we're going to change the endpoint and looping back to what uh, Quentin says, we're over asking the changes on liver histology and, and, and expect them to be predictive of the future. I think we'll see different endpoints being explored. We'll still use histology having patients going into trials, potentially then AI supported with a, let's say, promil area of ballooning on the biopsy or something like that to quantify it and then look at something different at the end of it. Thanks, Jorn. Luis? I think the guys have summed it up very well. That's their area of expertise. I suppose if I look at 24 months maybe the two years. Intercept, I believe, are reviewing all of their biopsy samples in relation to some of this information from their study. So they might have that data out, and that would be interesting to see that comparison. But um, no, I just think we need to be progressing. We've got technology for a reason. It can augment the processes that we've got. And I think if it improves the patient care, the outcome, and the productivity of these studies, then it should be used to best support the histopathology teams. Thanks. Thanks, all of you. I think if you've been listening to the few comments I've made during this discussion, my answer shouldn't surprise anybody. I'd like to take the emphasis off the, if you think about semi-quantitative as a word in 24-point type, the reality of where the error has lied historically is that semi has probably been in about 90-point type, and quantitative has probably been in about 8-point type, although we treat quantitative as the only thing that matters. Since quantitative is what matters, I'd like to see if we can change the type sizes, right? Uh, through use of uh, a 
basically through use of uh, AI-aided histopathology in and of itself, that should shrink semi and increase quantitative. And then if we do that without bias towards what are we measuring for, I think the example we're talking about this morning, which is don't count balloon hepatocytes, look at volume or some other metric, is a good example of that. Then we can shrink it further. Uh, to do any of that, though, you need data, really solid data. So in some ways, to me, the most exciting thing about this conversation is in any increased acceptance of AI guidance in this role will automatically automatically shrink semi and increase quantitative, thereby allowing us to, in a more opinion agnostic way, figure out where our lies and what we can do to improve it. And, and Quentin, to that end, uh, I commend you and, and Beth and, and, and everybody who was on this project, because um, between this and the Davison paper, when I, when I came into this field three years ago, I was astonished at how little was known and the degree to which people were looking at measures that were really sloppy and treating them like the only thing that mattered. Uh, the Davison paper and this work and a couple of other things are started to really clean that up. And, 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 and a lot of what's been done in omics, net result being, we know a lot more about what we're looking for and are now starting to figure out the smartest ways to figure out if we're getting there. So I don't know if that's 12 or 24 months, but I think that's really exciting. And um, with that, let me thank Louise and Jorn for taking an hour out of their busy days to do this one. Say uh, adieu to you folks for now. Jorn, thank Louise, you. thanks. Goodbye. Bye, guys. Thank you. Thank you. And now, Histoindex Chief Scientific Officer Dean Tai joins the surfers to discuss ways to train machines to identify ballooned hepatocytes more consistently. So uh, let me welcome everybody who was part of that first conversation back to this second conversation. And let me welcome people who only are picking up this extra episode to join us. I am fortunate to be joined by Quentin Anstey and Jorn Schottenberg and Maza Nuruddin and Dean Tai. What this portion of the conversation will focus on is the process by which we resolve what I described in the episode as taking the phrase semi-quantitative, which is how we evaluate now, shrinking the semi and increasing the quantitative so that we can become more consistent in what we do and give the idea of statistical error and consistency of results more meaning. We're going to do some of that by asking Dean to comment on that portion of the Brunt, Tai, et al. to Ant, to Anstey paper that was published last year and was such an important um, part of the hashtag this year. And then I'm going to ask Jorn to make comments or questions on that. And then Mazin is going to talk about the poster distinction he put up at ASLD last year, which discussed digital pathology in the context of uh, cirrhosis. And then we'll have more questions and comments. So with that, let me introduce our friend and colleague, Dean Tai um, from Histo Index. Dean, welcome. And please take a few minutes and walk us through that paper again with a specific point of view on what do we do to improve the quantitative nature of assessment of balloon hepatocytes, given how complex it is. Thank you, Roger. Our aim is to develop a total solution for pathology assessment. And we actually started this work very much focused in fibrosis. And in earlier days, we were very much focused in hepatitis B and hepatitis C. And during that space, we realized uh, we, we didn't talk about this much, but the standing variability is actually a key element for pathology assessment. The fact you have many different labs coming up different colors all the time, it adds another layer of complexity in order to do a proper pathology assessment. It wasn't so much a problem when you are trying to do semi-quantitative, when you're going categorical. But by the time we are now, just like Roger said, we want to focus on quantitative and strength semi, we realize it's important to address the standing variability as well. So with that in mind, uh, we, uh, we look at NASH and clearly everyone is talking about ballooning. So, so we really focus on ballooning. We have been working in fibrosis. We call it Q-fibrosis. We realize it's very important to have a proper understanding of morphology and in establish a proper ground truth. So by that, uh, we, we mean we need to understand what is the definition of fibrosis, what's the definition of ballooning, and exactly how they are interpreted by pathologists when they are looking at, at these images. So we, we, we have to take it to another le level, just not look at the basic definition in like what's being written on the paper for Nessia and system. So this work was initiated by Quinting and Beth, and it involved more than 20 key opinion leaders in in NASH, both the hepatologists and pathologists. I'm, I'm very appreciative and very happy they're all willing to help us to develop AI, for the, which is we think is the future, and use this to solve an immediate problem on hand. So specifically, what we are trying to do is to, to evaluate intervention efficacy. We are really not talking about trying to come out with a uh, 
a diagnosis. We, we try to really address the need here is the intervention efficacy. In this paper, I think we're very happy with the performance, uh, particularly, for example, in terms of reproducibility. So we have uh, pathologists they can perform as good as 90% reproducibility when we, you know, we rotate the images and ask them to annotate again. So the pathologist can do as good as 90% and our AI can do this as good as 99%. And we have a ground truth. This ground truth is defined by majority of pathologist agreement. The solution we're providing here is really to capture the majority agreed hepatocytes with a 99% reproducibility. So this is basically what we intended in the first place. We, we wanted to use this to evaluate intervention efficacy. Now we're actually moving to the next part, you know, trying to do the next phase is really how to use this information, how to develop a tool for the post-drug approval era. So with that, maybe I'll stop here and take on any questions or comments. Thank you. Well, Dean, uh, congratulations again. I think we discussed the paper with Quentin previously and came out great for what your team did here and, and, and how they supported this. I, I think you addressed the reliability or called it the re-identification of a balloon cell by the same histopathologist, the machine with 99%, the best uh, pathologist, 90%. Uh, you didn't mention probably that it will drop lower in other histopathologists, not speaking of histopathologists that are not specifically trained for NASH. So maybe uh, you can give us some granularity or some more information on, you know, what's the range between histopathologists, not to say that they are not good at this, but just to get an idea. One aspect is as we enroll more patients, we need more histopathologists to be involved. And uh, what is the, I, I'm afraid it will probably introduce more variability at that level, not because, again, not because the histopathologist is not able to call it that way. It's just that the human system has more variability in it. Yes, so you're right. There is a great variability in terms of uh, reproducibility. So that range in our study itself, we're looking at anywhere from 40 to 90%. So as you say, it's a very big range. And I, I maybe want to add one comment about this because unlike fibrosis, steatosis, and inflammation, we are really differentiating a specific uh, cell type. Okay? Ballooning is a spectrum. It's part of the hepatocyte family. So you are really trying to identify bad apples from all the apples. You know, you're not trying to identify oranges from apples. So that's actually this spectral nature of ballooning made it intrinsically difficult to re be reproducible. So what we did here is really, you know, even for the, the human to go back, we felt establishing this threshold, you know, even for whether it's a human or it's a machine, it's difficult to maintain this reproducibility. So what we do with the AI is that we are able to establish this threshold, and that's how we achieve 99%. Dean, one of the things that Quentin was talking about, about this paper, actually, in, in the last conversation about Q2 learning, was the idea that, um, and this came from comments Stephen made about how he was trained, that that really it isn't the balloon in a vacuum that you tend to look and see if how much likely you think it is the steatosis is there. And then if, if you think more likely, then you look harder and then ballooning picks up some of that. When you talk about the range of variability for the individual going from 40 to 90 percent, A, is that a major contributing factor or how major a factor is that in the 40 to 90 percent range? Do you have a feel for that? Um and then B, what are the other factors that might lead us to understand why some people have higher um, concordance than others do? First of all, I'm just explaining what the data is showing. So there are what we call basically over color and under color. So there are people basically continuously uh, over color a lot more than others. But at the same time, they are self-consistent. So I think that means uh, they have a, a level of threshold internally. And I also want to highlight that we didn't have a communication. So the group didn't reach a consensus before this exercise. So this group of experts, we are basically they are relying on their past experience in order to do that. So they are very consistent with their level of threshold. So I think that's one of the contributing factors. So if we had this consensus discussion earlier, which is in the context of uh, clinical trials, I believe they will reduce this error. But having said that, it's still not a perfect solution. Yeah, I mean, just to extend what Dean was saying there, because one of the things we did in the paper was we tried to look or, you know, what is it that makes certain pathologists run hot and versus running cold in terms of their ability to see ballooning. So we actually looked to see, well, how much weight did different pathologists put on the size of cells? And there were clear differences there that individuals 
individuals who expected a very large cell always to be a balloon, you know, necessary to be determined to be a balloon cell, tended to see fewer balloon cells. But if you were more permissive and said, well, you know, a balloon cell could be quite big or very big, you tended to see more and more balloon cells. So there were certain patterns of behavior that were part of it. And, you know, as we mentioned, scores like SAF that do provide a little bit more definition of what is a balloon cell are potentially helpful in that respect when you compare it to how NAS is scored. Nevertheless, to my mind, because of the subtleties of assimilating all the visual clues to, to identify a balloon cell, I'm not sure this is just a case of training because we had a group of very highly trained pathologists here. This is something where we need to provide an additional layer of assistance to really standardize. The idea. thing that came up to me now listening to Quentin is if it's not about the training of the histopathologist, then I guess there are no, even if you're highly trained, there are no clear rules because there's no clear picture. There's not this one balloon hepatocytes. They do not, it's biology. They don't always look the same. I think that's what it comes down to. And then it depends on your personal experience, the amount of tissue you've seen over your career and, and maybe other factors, whether you call it balloon or not. So again, uh, uh, quantification versus semi-quantification, there is no yes or no answer to this is what it comes down to me. And, and I and I think that's why it's so important to loop in the machine and augment the histological call. No, I, I agree with you, Sean. And, you know, we, we know that if you put the pathologists together and they discuss and they review images, they do harmonize for a while. But what we don't know is how long that tuning of the violin stays before the strings stretch a little bit and definitions begin to, to move away again. This speaks to the to the issue here. So, yes, you can improve inter-observer variation, but even and that doesn't necessarily mean that you've found the right answer. You've just got people to agree on a, on a concept. So it, it is a really challenging area, this. That makes that makes tremendous sense. Miles, and you have anything you want to add or question? No, I actually have a question. Like, so, um, and I, um, I probably should look at the paper into more detail. So what was the final conclusion of the balloon side that you guys agreed on? Is it the consensus of the nine or what are you carrying on in, in your machine learning model? That, how does the balloon set look like? Obviously, Mazen, there isn't a right answer to the question. If you use only the cells where, for example, seven pathologists all agree that they're ballooned to train an algorithm, and this is what Dean modeled very, very elegantly, you will find that the algorithm is more specific potentially but less sensitive. Whereas if you train it with just every cell that any pathologist thought might be ballooned, you then have a an algorithm which is much more sensitive, but much less specific. And so we selected a midpoint in the paper of a concordance of five pathologists because it was a useful point for discussion. The reality is here that what we've observed in this phenomenon in terms of how you can tune the algorithm potentially allows you to actually dial its sensitivity and specificity up or down according to the question you're wanting to ask. So if you want to be absolutely sure that there isn't a single balloon cell anywhere, no siree, then you turn it one way. On the other hand, if you want to be identifying cells that the majority of pathologists, or you know, in, in English law, we have the concept of the man on the Clapham omnibus, which is basically the man in the street. So if we have the pathologist on the Clapham omnibus, then you turn it the other way and, and, and um, dial your sensitivity and specificity in that direction. I understood it well. <laughs> I think it's brilliant. I do wonder for the clinical trial purpose, I'm just thinking loud, if it won't make more sense to be on the specific side than the sensitive side. Because the sensitive side will, you know, at the end, you, the, your drug will not work for sure. <laughs> Dean and I are both nodding like fools as you said that. We, we completely agree. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So so the idea is really, like Quentin keeps saying, is not to look for the absence of ballooning, but really to see the trend and the quantitative change that you can highly reproduce to, to, to verify the, the change. So, but then with the level of the, the compromised sensitivity in a way, but yet you, you get a very clear uh, look at how the the intervention is working. So that's an important point because this makes it an unusual, a useful tool in a phase two trial, but not in a phase three trial. 
because you're saying, you know, if if we still have to, if we're still stuck with the resolution of Nash picture on the on the drug approval pathway, it will be difficult just to show a trend downwards. But I think it's very important in a phase two trial where you want, you know, a dose effect established and you want to see it goes to the right direction. Actually, that's why we are working on the next part of the study, specifically trying to extend this to look at phase trial and even post drug approval. You know, what what to do with this? Yeah, and don't understand me right wrong. I think it, that's it can help there, but. Based on what you say, you know, showing the reduction, this is not going to be an approval blend. Then the question becomes what's the right way to use it in this kind of setting? I obviously, say phase two, not phase three, but to what degree, I guess I'm asking, were we talking about sample challenges in large populations and all that phase three is really where you spending money and time, right? So do we have any thoughts on what might make phase three work better? from this perspective? So for right now, uh, what we are working on is definitely, I think one thing is to correlate these into clinical endpoints. You know, basically, I think that's the best way to answer this question. Meanwhile, another thing we're looking at, which is the what we call colocalization with fibrosis. So this is actually something we, we are pounding down with steatosis and fibrosis as well. So what we have learned in steatosis is that when there's a significant reduction in steatosis, you know, fibrosis changes not evenly across uh, where, where so across the biopsy. So we, where there is co-localization co with steatosis change, we actually see them, the change is more correlating to mechanism of action. So the, that's what we are looking into next. So this is actually where the AI can really help now, as part of this paper, we actually identify that the learning index is some of them is actually fibrosis. That means pathologists are at some level when they evaluate, they actually are affected by the fibrosis around a balloon hepatocyte. So when we actually later talk about it, the pathologists all acknowledge that they are aware of that despite this is not kind of part of the requirement for ballooning. So so this is basically what we are looking into as well. How, how do you co-localize? What, what that means is you can actually see collagen wrapping a balloon cell. Go. So, so that's actually something we actually kind of see and in some cases there are some inflammatory cells in that complex as well. So we see isolated balloons and we see clusters of balloons and in the cases of clusters you can see a very distinct collagen pattern within this cluster. They are wrapping balloon cells which is not so much a kind of peri normal perisinusoidal fibrosis pattern we see in a healthy hepatocyte. As Dean says, this piece of work that we published now was necessary because because of the variation in how ballooning is identified as it currently stands, we don't have a stable enough concept of a balloon cell to then be able to go on and look to see what are the ramifications? How does that influence pathophysiology? What does this mean? So the work that we've published here, beyond its relevance for the regulatory science for drug development, is actually the foundation for a whole slew of further study to really understand the biology of ballooning and how it interacts with fibrogenesis and so on. And, you know, as I mentioned earlier, potential to use it and, you know, these sort of AI tools as a standard against which we can reassess uh, omics data sets and so on. So it, it's it's a gatekeeper step to allow us to uh, advance the field on a number of different fronts. And when I think back of sitting down with my pathologist, they normally call out balloon cells and inflammatory infiltrates together, not so much the fibrosis bundles wrapping around that, which is very interesting because it speaks to, again, the regenerative response. Uh, that, and that could be a very different fibrosis band compared to a to a scar fibrosis band that's building up. Uh, I agree. There's so much interesting aspects that we could potentially learn on the pathophysiology, you know, resolution versus progression and these type of things. I have to say one, one of the strengths of these techniques that, you know, Dean and the team have developed is that you're looking at the fibrosis and the ballooning in the same section because you're not having to use a different stain to pick up the finer fibrosis, for example, which immediately moves you a few microns away from the H&E section. I, I think that adds to the power of this. That's just my speculation, but, but I think it's worth remembering. Yeah, I mean, uh, this project actually has started many years ago. I, I like to sometimes read 
previous literature and I went back, I think as far as 10 years, and I was looking at Lupe Garcia's trial work on hepatitis C. And the concept was in, in she, she published in Stratix, but what Dr. Garcia Tsao was studying back then that she's saying, well, the conventional histology looking at fibrosis might be missing a few important elements of the cirrhosis architect. She started looking into a few things uh, in the cirrhosis architect, such as septal thickness, which we know it's very important in, in cirrhosis. And even in the Nash field, the JHEP paper uh, by Zuberio Nasi showed that uh, more collagen and septal thickness, they, they, they define these cryptogenic cirrhosis people that they are more likely to lead to outcome. So back to Professor Garcia Tsao's work. So she they started semi-quantitatively, speaking of semi, uh, looking into septal thickness nodules, the, how many nodules you have in the cirrhotic liver, uh, how big is the nodule, as well as the fibrosis area, which has been concept around for and studied in, 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 in NASH through the collagen content. So in her work, she combined these three features, septal thickness, nodule features, and fibrosis area. And in few studies, she looked at if adding them adds value. And it did, but they were conflicting data. And they attributed the conflicted data into the semi-quantitative approach. And they suggested that's the reason why we're getting conflicted data, yet we still believe septal thickness nodules features in fibrosis area are very important. And there was a landmark review by Lupe and Dr. Scott Friedman on, on that topic. So um, I think in 2017, or I don't remember, Dean, or 2018, I, I reached out to um, Stephen Harrison and Nago Chalasani, who are the, the PIs in the Galactin study, and asked them if we can look at that using uh, machine learning and this is when the ball started rolling and then Dean and his team got involved and Dr. Zach Goodman started looking into multiple, multiple histological variables related to the septa nodules and, and, and fibrosis using these concepts. And the reason why we use the Galactin study because as you know it's one of very few studies that it had oral pressures and we wanted to correlate new this new kind of histological thinking to oral pressure measurements, clinic, clinically significant portal hypertension, as well as um, changes in the portal pressures by 20%, which, as you know, clinically significant portal hypertension and changes in them correlated with outcomes and, and improvement in outcomes. So this is when the work started. It took a few years. There were about 450-something histological variables that Histo Index identified in cirrhotics. The majority related to the septa, about 250 some related to nodules, about 20 and about 180 for fibrosis. So again, like it's kind of redrawing the architect on histology uh, for sources using what we call it septa nodule and fibrosis, S-N-O-F, we call it the SNOF uh, or SNOF score, whatever you want to call it. So when we use each feature of machine learning, they did correlate well with border hypertension. However, when you put them together, the septa nodules and fibrosis features in a score that was very reliable in detecting portal hypertension, clinically significant portal hypertension with area under the curve of 0.85 and in the validation cohort of 0.74. Importantly, also from that study, we went beyond that. There were varices that have been developed or existed, either existed at the beginning of the study or developed throughout the study. So we looked of this SNOOF or whatever or you call it, it can distinguish the presence of varices or not, and it did actually. So the area under the curve for that SNOOF varices score was 0.86 and the validation was about 0.7 something. Importantly and finally, changes in the SNOOF score correlated with changes of portal pressure of more than 20%, which a lot of people use as kind of measurement point to see if HVPG is changing and the, it's the distinguished that changes by or under the curve of 0.89. And in a summary, that was going beyond the conventional histology for cirrhosis, adding important features using histo index second generation method to look at important features, which is nodules, fibrosis, as well as septal thickening. And we correlated with important outcomes in clinical trials, such as varices, clinically significant hypertension, and changes in portal hypertension. So in a way, it gets validated more. You can go in the future and stop using portal pressure 
pressure measurements, which we kind of stopped because it has been really difficult, but I'm still hearing this new trial coming with portal pressure measurements. So just imagine if that trial did not measure portal pressure and use this new technology because it, it does have good correlation with portal pressure and portal pressure changes, even varices. And as you know, there was a similar effort on AI by other groups, but I think some of the features that we consider here were not considered in that paper, but we considered um, all major important features that our fibrosis expert looked at a decade ago. Thanks, Marcin. That was fantastic. Got to ask a quick question, Mazen. Uh, congratulations. Um, very nice study. I'm a little concerned that you have a lot of collinearity in your in your score because my understanding of progressive fibrosis in the liver is you get thickening of septa, you get nodules. And um, I would expect that in the presence of nodules, you have more portal hypertension because you really have the scarred off tissue and so on. I'm not challenging the data. My question to you is how much does the bandwidth then or the fibrosis septa information add if you have already uh, established nodules and maybe you I'm not sure you had the chance to look at that but that's just you know thinking about it pathophysiologically where does this snoof add in here thank you for this question Yarn. so uh, and Dean maybe you also can uh, I would like to have your input I mean uh, to, to get to this score as I mentioned um, we, we evaluated each one of them separately and they performed well and then through statistical me methods we found um, out of all the features as I mentioned, there are 250 features of the septa, for instance, and we picked through statistical me method the best ones that will improve the, the outcome we're looking for. And the septa did add uh, accuracy to the nodules when we combined it in the uh, SNOOF score. So I, I don't know if that answers your question, and I'm interested in Dean's thoughts as well. Actually, in cyrotic samples, we, we, we realized that a huge collapse. So you can have one big chunk of portal track you can probably spot like five portal track or or, or string together there's no no more tissue everything collapsed so so we actually had a problem kind of establishing is this a big portal track or is it a septa so how to properly define what you say septa width and bear in mind this is a needle biopsy so you you you're also kind of limited by the size of the needle itself. For example, the width is probably as far as we can measure. So this is something that's very interesting we're actually trying to do. So when we do this correlation, what Mazen described, we didn't dig in too much into that. And I think there's a very interesting question we, we should actually really expand more into looking into this uh, septa versus nodule. Yeah, ag again, and also because of thinking that, you know, the type of septa, the thickness and the, the structure of it could address is this really something that's on the way out, progressing or regressing. That's something that I'm uh, very interested in and, and particularly important in drug trials, of course. Then. Agreed. Let me run with that. I'd like to, in the time we have remaining, ask you a question. You say in the context of clinical trials, how do you see this work? You made, you made the comment before about phase two and phase three trials. What do you see as the impact of this work on clinical trial conduct today? And if you take the research down a couple of steps in the direction that Dean has described, how do you think it might affect trials then? I can take a jab at it and then maybe others... As I said, this is a work that has been done on, on, on one trial. As I mentioned, there's an, another work from the Simtizumab, kind of the same concept. I think both are great work, but this, this one in particular had the key features that the fibrosis experts have talked about before. You know, as you know, like cirrhosis is a beast and cirrhotic trials have been uh, very challenging. So I'm a total believer in the cirrhotic trials, what, whatever you're looking for, you, you really need uh, machine learning and artificial intelligence because because the, this conventional thinking that we need to go one stage fibrosis is, is great if we can get it, but it, it can be very difficult and we could be missing a lot of fibrosis changes in cirrhotics uh, just by looking at this conventional one fibrosis improvement. So measuring collagen content, measuring fibrosis in more details, especially in the cirrhotics is very important because as you know, in cirrhotic trials, one, you need a very accurate assessment of what's changed fibrosis. Two, you need a good duration for fibrosis to change if the drug is working. And if you have an accurate tool showing every single tedious and fibrosis improvement, that will be very important. Now, in terms of this paper, since it did correlate, the scores correlate with existing ovaries, uh, 
changes in polar pressures that we know historically uh, they correlated with outcomes, I think you can start start looking into these scores in such cirrhotic trials and their histology and see if they are moving uh, the needle and eventually connect them to outcome to just go beyond the conventional thinking of what should be done in cirrhotic trials. Because those are the trials that w- we still don't know a lot and we still don't know how to approach them uh, to show improvement other than just, well, outcomes are, of course, the, the best thing you can look at, but it's not easy to do outcome studies. So if you want to go for histology, I think you really need like more details in terms of fibrosis changes and their relation to outcomes. Just to add quickly, and I totally agree, uh, Mazen, I think if you were looking at fibrosis regression, you're going to look at those very early cirrhotics that are difficult to to find. And then you are in an, in an arena where some are F3 and some are F4 and the biopsy might not categorize them correctly. And I, I think that's also in, in, uh, a danger in that field if you're only looking at fibrosis regression. So I support the notion that there is additional information that needs to be explored in the cirrhotic population. Now, not, not to mention also in, in cirrhotics, most people are going to try to uh, treat or start treatment with the compensated cirrhosis because they are easier. But we know that these compensated cirrhotics are, are, are not one bucket. They are probably different levels of compensated cirrhotics and different severity. And uh, that has been talked about before uh, by uh, Garcia Tsao and, and, and Friedman. And actually, they use this approach to subclassify the NASH, the compensated NASH cirrhotics. So it will help teasing out could be different severities of compensated cirrhotic and target the right population for a certain MOA. Mazen, a closing thought. The aggregate impact of what we've been talking about here, the use and some of what we've learned about the specific nature of the use of AI, A, in the context of clinical trials, we just talked about cirrhosis, but maybe more broadly, and then B, in in the conduct of the ongoing evaluations around NITs and AI histopathology, where you think that will fit in the clinical trial architecture of the next few years. Let me start with Quentin on the clinical trial question, then I'll go back to whoever would like to answer. We're trying to do a better job of correlating different non-invasive measures and histopathology logical measures to get to outcomes and a better understanding of what we capture in a clinical trial. I'm wondering the specific ways in which you think this work will push us ahead. Yeah, no, I think that's a really good question. And and this comes down to the, the, the crux of the matter. So if we think about the current trial paradigm, Roger, obviously we use a biopsy as an accepted surrogate um, because we believe it predicts cirrhosis, which we in turn believe is going to be predictive of hard outcomes. What we are doing in Litmus and also in the United States in the the Nimble Consortium is we are trying to identify non-invasive biomarkers that may be able to do many of those same things that histology can. But at the moment, we're working by basically comparing our non-invasives to histology. And the problem there is that without a standardized read, it means that we're comparing a non-invasive test that might be highly accurate to a potentially less accurate, or at least one of the first things here and one of the immediate applications for this sort of work is to be able to standardize our histological assessments as the reference point for the further development and validation of non-invasive biomarkers. And it's great from that point of view that within Litmus, um, Dean and the Histo Index team are one of the partners in that consortium, working with Jean and myself and, and all the other partners, specifically so that we can start to do that and to improve our histological standard and therefore improve the reference point for the development and validation of non-invasive biomarkers. So as we fix the histology in terms of inter-observer variation, we're going to both help ourselves develop better trial endpoints and also help ourselves develop non-invasives that can support drug development in the future. So it, it's a it's a double win, really. Okay. Other thoughts? Remembering the first conversation we had here and my question to Quentin is, I'd still like to see a, a compound score looping in some of the biomarkers, as Quentin stressed, and those technologies and, and really come up with a, a full picture of something that cannot be captured on, on liver histology uh, by itself and, and putting patients into buckets based on those multiple assessments we gain so much knowledge on these days the nash a1c that's what you're thinking about yeah uh, well 
<laughs> if only it was that easy. Um, yeah, I, I know. Mean, <laughs> I, I think to, to Jean's point, and we're already seeing this with NITs as we begin to leverage proteomics approaches, transcriptomics approaches, we're understanding that it's, again, a complex disease and that a single index, a single blood test, a single measure analyte is unlikely to be the answer here. It is likely to be a multi-analyte pa- panel uh, to most accurately characterize it. And if you think back to the, the meta-cohort data that Litmus presented at easel and ASLD last year in various different forms. It's striking there that it's some of the somologic biomarkers, which of course those panels include about 35 different proteins, were some of the better performing ones, certainly outperforming simple scores like Fib4. So we're already beginning to see a graduation and the more you include in your model, potentially the greater fidelity it has. There'll be a limit to that, but it, but it is an interesting phenomenon. Okay, and then let me ask that question to Dean. So where do you see this heading in the context of supporting trials better and um, also a better understanding of the way to improve our methodologies over time? First of all, I agree with what you said earlier about being shrinking the CME and really going in quantitative. Uh, another thing is that the current histology assessment is, is kind of limited by the category system, you know, the next and you eventually record it as a category one or two or three or four. But in fact, what's being described is morphology. You know, we, we've been talking about the peri perisinusoidal fibrosis. So it's really to actually a- enable you to quantify morphology, which was really the intention of the system at that time. Uh, so so this is another level which I think we need to put a lot more effort into it because right now people kind of, the whole one point reduction is actually a consequence of that. But the fact is that we see the features reduction, like what we don't say about it, the, the, the facts. Uh, you have different set type. One is indicating progressing, one is indicating regressing. We see it all the time. I think everyone sees it and they, they believe, they, they are convinced that's what's happening. AI can really come in and help to really address all these subtle changes in a fully quantitative, fully reproducible manner. And this really is a powerful tool for the drug development. Okay. So th- thank you very much, Dean. Anybody have any comments? Uh, we should just wrap up. We should wrap up. Does anybody have any comments before we do that? All right. Then let me thank um, everybody, uh, Quentin, both Dean and Mazen, for your initial presentations in this section, Quentin and Jorn, as well as Dean and Mazen, for your thoughtful comments and questions. We will be producing this as part of the episode. We will also be producing it separately for anybody who simply wants to hear this conversation. And with that, let me bid everybody uh, a good day, and hopefully we'll all talk soon. I'm going to stop recording now. I'll be back with business section in a couple of minutes. Thanks. This episode of Surfing the Nash Tsunami has been sponsored by Histoindex, the world's leading specialist in stain-free AI digital pathology solutions for Nash clinical trials. Join Histoindex for its complimentary webinar, Deciphering Nash, Fibrosis Dynamics in Cirrhotic Patients and Insights into Ballooned Hepatocytes Using AI at 11 a.m. Eastern Daylight Time on Tuesday, March 23rd. For more information on the webinar, visit the Season 3 Episode 14 in Histoindex sponsor pages on the Surfing Nash website. And now for the Season 3 Episode 14 Business Report. Spoiler alert, something really special will happen at the end of this report. Stick around. Now, back to today. Wasn't that session fascinating? I said this during the episode, so please forgive, but I continue to be impressed by how far the science of fatty liver disease has come in the past three years. It hasn't translated into a new generation of medications yet, but the more we know about the disease, the better solutions developers will design. For patients and treating physicians, uh, better days are ahead and maybe pretty soon. March is really strong. I'll go further. The schedule from here through mid-April is really, really strong. Next week, Magical Pharmaceuticals will be sponsoring our wrap-up of the second annual Liver Connect Conference. Stephen will be on family vacation, but Mazen Nouradine and Naeem al Khoury, who are speaking at the conference, have already signed on. We are hoping to have at least one chronic liver disease foundation officer with us. That would be first. And one or two more key opinion leaders beyond that. The next two weeks after that, we'll focus on what disease models can teach us about drug development strategy, with Chris Estes joining us. And after that, Jonathan Epstein's extraordinary work linking CAR T-cells to mRNA, the kind used in the COVID vaccine 19s to dissolve fibrosis. Scott Freeman will join us for that one, along with the renowned Neil Henderson from the University of Edinburgh. Perhaps we can uh, coax Scott into scaring his impressive mock Scottish brogue. Which brings us to April. 
The first week in April, we'll preview the Innovations in Nafield Care 2022 workshop taking place in Barcelona the first week in May. While this meeting will discuss medication somewhat, its largest focus will be on what we can do now and anywhere in the world to stem the Nash pandemic. The week after that, we return to thinking about Nail and IT with Naeem Al Khoury and Jorn Schottenberg sharing thoughts about the items that Stephen and Mazen felt they could report within a year or two. We'll evaluate. The rest of the second quarter will include the Innovations Conference in Barcelona itself, the Fifth Global Nash Congress, and live in London, Easel. Listen here for more news. The buzz is back, and there are interesting tidbits in the vault. Last week, listeners returned to the vault and for some interesting pieces. The most downloaded episode from 2020 and 2021 was our 12th episode ever back in the spring of 2020, which focused on the FDA's complete response letter to Intercept Pharmaceuticals over OCA. Not sure who was looking and why, but it was a lot of people. The second largest pre-2022 episode continues to be the Splendor Study Series S2E61 and some of its conversations. That discusses the impact of bariatric surgery and just weight loss on cirrhosis. More recently, while Season 3, Episode 11, the introduction of Nail NIT, is less than a month old. It's tracking ahead of virtually all our other episodes were at that point in its life. Congrats to Stephen, Mazen, Amy, and Sen, who have clearly struck a responsive chord among our audience, at least. I want to thank our team, Magic Mike, Eric, Steve, and Murph Magnificent, for our continued success as we push forward into larger audiences and new frontiers. We'll have announcements on that in the next few weeks. I keep promising that, but one of them is tiptoeing towards uh, the threshold, and so is the second. I promised something special at the end of this episode. In solidarity with our brothers and sisters in Ukraine, I will end every week signing off with an inspirational Ukraine Ukrainian phrase until this issue is over. This week, let me say, Sabuto Ukraina, which translates loosely into all will be Ukraine. To our friends in Ukraine, what you are going through is indescribably horrible. You have our hearts and our undying appreciation and respect for your resolve. Stay strong. And with that, I'm off. Stay safe. Surf on. I look forward to seeing you again next week on the podcast. Bye bye now. Have any questions for the surfers? You can send them to surfingnash.com and we will answer on the podcast or the website.